the issue of private ownership of public services isn't just limited to this this fantastic infrastructure bank. It's also becoming a reality through these so-called trade agreements. Uh, if you could talk a little bit about what these things actually are, uh, CETA for one, TPP for another. Um, we, we, we hear um, in the media how the U.S. have pulled out of the TPP, but there's, there's a lot of work in the background going on to keep them involved or to start a new one. Because there is another acronym out there in relation to the TPP that's even more powerful. Yeah, no, no, I, I totally agree with you. And by the way, in focusing on the infrastructure bank, I didn't mean to, the, the, you're right, there's so many other things going on. And it's absolutely true that in the trade agreements, this is one of the biggest concerns, is that they want to put in mechanisms that will actually prevent uh, the expansion of our public services. Uh, you, you know, this is a big fear, for instance, in the healthcare area. I mean, we've got this threat now with Brian Day, Dr. Brian Day out in BC, uh, you know, trying to strike down our healthcare laws so that he can bring in, uh, you know, open the floodgates to private medicine. He's got these two private orthopedic clinics that are in trouble because of the way they've been billing. Uh, and he's trying to go beyond that and actually strike down the whole legislation. And similarly, there's fears that under NAFTA, that if, uh, you know, that if we wanted to, to, to expand, you know, into, let's say, uh, a pharmacare program, other, there, there's all kinds of things we should be expanding in the public health care area and in so many other areas, and that the, under NAFTA will actually have restrictions that'll prevent us from doing that kind of thing. Let, let me just quickly add, um, you know, the, the, the uh, investor state dispute mechanism of NAFTA, which I'm sure you're all familiar with. I, I just wanna make the point, like here we are now, uh, I just wrote a column about this the other day, but uh, you know, we're now in the situation where Trump has forced us into renegotiating NAFTA. Uh, and, and I was never a fan of NAFTA at all, but it's very interesting what's happening. There was a big spread in the globe, uh, and it was pointing out, you know, yes, Canada's got to be tough, we've got to stand up. And it was pointing out, you know, maybe we even want to get some things changed ourselves. But then it mentioned sort of the two areas where we've got to fight these things that are so important for Canada. And what were they? Anyone want to guess? No. Did I hear cheese? Yes, dairy. Those cows. And softwood lumber. That, that, those are the only two things according to the Globe, that we should be pushing back on. How about the investor state, uh, you know, clause that allows, that allows corporations to sue governments if those governments take actions that interfere, you know, in the public interest, these actions, that interfere with the profit-making opportunities of those companies, and we've already, this isn't some theoretical thing, we've already, I can't remember the number, but we've already had, does anyone remember, it's about 30 of 29, I think, of these cases against Canada. We've lost most of them, uh, and we've had to pay out something like uh, $200 million, which the media never even covers, it's astonishing. Like, this is just an outrage. And just let me quickly add one other one that I was focusing on in my column because nobody talks about it at all. Talk about erosion of sovereignty. In NAFTA, there's a section that requires, that that's basically gives Washington control over our energy. It, it, it's the proportionality clause, section 605, it prevents us from cutting back our exports of oil to the U.S., um, it, it, like even in the case of an emergency. So, so like it, a world, a global oil shortage like we used to have in the 70s. If something like that happened and we said, oh my God, we gotta stop shipping oil to the U.S. because uh, particularly Quebec and, 
And the Atlantic provinces, they, they depend on imported oil. If that were to be cut off because of global oil shortages, it would not be legal for us to transfer that Alberta oil that's going to the U.S. to Canada. That's not allowed under NAFTA. How can that not be an issue that we should address at the, in these negotiations? And, and, and um, I won't, it's too complicated to get it, but there's also a, a global warming angle to it about why it's all the more pressing that we shouldn't uh, uh, let them have control of our oil. But, but in any event, uh, yes, I, I thank you for that. You're 100% you're correct. I've focused on the, this new bank, but the, the areas in which privatization, and it's, it's just everywhere. It, it, it's truly frightening. I see Eva over here on your right. Hi. Hi. Um, I wonder if in your research, if you've ever come across um, what the pulse is on Canadians and how they feel about, we know that they want their programs and their social programs and Medicare and all those kinds of things. Um, what is the pulse on how they feel about who supports that program? So do they care who is underlining that? You, you mean who delivers those programs, whether it's privately? Well, like in our classification as CSs, a lot of times, you know, we're not the ones delivering right, the end right. result, but we are supporting with IT that delivery right. to them. So do they care of who's supporting it as long as they deliver it? You know, the, it's an in, interesting question. I mean, I haven't seen, um, there probably is, but I haven't seen specific, or at least I can't remember right now, specific polling on that. But, you know, my guess would be that it's kind of part and parcel of the wanting a strong public role that you would want the workforce to be part of that publicness. You know, like, I, I, I think the truth is there's just a lot more support for the idea that these are our things and we collectively want to have them. For instance, you take something like um, hydro, you know, the privatization of Hydro One by the Wynn government. Uh, I think she thought, well, you know, they, of course, they want their uh, hydro to come into the, her house, but you know, what, what more does it matter than that? The people, the, and the polls are very strong on this, like 75% are against, totally against the privatization of Hydro One, despite all the propaganda and everything. I think what that says to me is that Canadians just kind of trust this public thing. And, and part and parcel of that, and I think this is, you know, essentially part of your campaign, is that part and parcel of that is that you as public servants are part of that public deal. You know, it, it, for reasons like the preservation of institutional knowledge, you know, uh, and, and the, the selection, the proper selection of personnel, like, it, that whole thing that, you know, people complain that the public sector hiring process is so difficult. Well, it's difficult for a reason. It's difficult because it's trying to accomplish certain goals. It's trying to accomplish goals like bilingualism and regional balance and things like that. And things like wanting fair and impartial hiring. You know, you want that in any organization, but you put particularly want it with government because government is managing our money and you don't want the government to be able to kind of use, you know, government gets elected and then it can sort of use that as a trough to feed all its friends or anybody that supported them or voted for them or whatever. You want a very careful vetting process in hiring people for the public service. You want it to be very professional. Uh, and you don't, want, you don't want nepotism, and you want to be able to 
identify the most skilled and appropriate person. You want this to be a meritocracy. So I think, I think for all those, and you want people, uh, well, remember that whole fuss when, um, when there was the concern, the privacy concern about that American company that was going to be hiring some of the pri Canadian private data um, because of the U.S. Patriot, Patriot Act that was going to allow them to disclose some of that information. See, I think what part of, you, you know, people could have thought, well, what's the big deal? Government people are handling my private data. But I think people have a different feeling about uh, government people. I think there's a sense that government will properly monitor its people and the government carefully choose its people and carefully monitor them. And that, I, I guess maybe I'm going too far here, but that even people that choose to go into the public sector do so because they kind of believe in a public purpose. You know, the people that are more interested in profits and greed and stuff, they go to business school. So I, and I think the public kind of gets that at some level. Great, I have two more people on this uh, speakers, uh, sorry, questioners list, and after that uh, we'll, we'll cut it off. So Steve Anderson, then Robert Bowie-Reed. Thank you for your uh, really good talk. I really appreciate that. Um, and um, I hope this isn't too harsh of a, a thing to say, but um, I agree totally with what you're saying about the special driving lanes for rich people and special uh, uh, benefits for the, the wealthy and that sort of thing. But I do disagree with the, the men part and the older part. <laughs> no, 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 really. Because, like, if the shoe was on the other foot and, you, and people stood at the front and they criticized other demographic groups, I don't really see the bearing on, on that. Like, I suppose there's a wider social issue, but I, again, well, I, I, thank you very much. I do agree with largely what you're saying, but just a few points there. No, no, listen, can I just say I apologize if there was any offense taken. Like, I, I really, I didn't mean that as a serious point. I, I meant that as for a little levity. Uh, I'm not actually against rich older men. <laughs> but I, I don't know if I'll go any further on that. <laughs> Robert? Yeah, thank you. Thanks for your presentation. Um, I wanted to go a little bit deeper as to um, whether or not some of my fears about the debate in Canada are justified or not, particularly when you look south of the border. Um, I mean, certainly through my life, it has been my impression that these right wing think tanks and stuff like that is the same old superficial. Uh, I got ours, and we're going to keep it. I mean, that's been around since, you know, uh, the money was invented probably before. But one thing I, I'm wondering, and because you're much more involved, plugged into the political rounds, so you can t give, give me your opinion of it. Certainly in the States, uh, one of the key driving unifier philosophies around this whole thing about, you know, public service is bad, rich people are good, is the uh, so-called um, philosophy of Ayn Rand. Mm -hmm. And uh, I haven't heard a lot about that within the Canadian context. In the States, you just scratch the typical right wing, like the Speaker of the House of Representatives, you know, uh, used to be a big Randian. Now, because he's ca devout Catholic, he sort of disowned her a little bit because <laughs> the Catholic Church hates her. But certainly almost all these right-wing people uh, read her books, recommend they read the books. Is this going on in Canada? Because if so, I mean, not that, I mean, you could debate whether Randyism is used for illumination or support. <laughs> you know, do they yeah. support her because they agree with her or because she agrees with them? But, is that, are you seeing that starting to get into the Canadian discussion? Because yeah, that makes no. it much more difficult to deal with because then they say, 
well, we've got this fundamental philosophy of life that backs it up as more than just pure greed, or to put it bluntly, greed is good, but maybe yeah. more deeper than that. Okay, that, that's an interesting question. You're, you're basically asking, uh, like you're saying, this, you, this is maybe true in the U.S. and less true in Canada. Yeah, no, that, that's interesting. Let, let me just say, um, f first of all, I, I would argue in the U.S. this, you know, this has kind of exploded, uh, this kind of right-wing extremism. It, wa it wasn't like this 30 years ago. Uh, Eisenhower, if you look at some of his policies, was quite moderate. Uh, but it, it's really exploded. And I would argue it's less to do with Ayn, Ayn Rand and more to do with the Koch brothers financing everything so so much, um, you know, they've just, you know, multi, multi-billionaires that have diverted huge untold amounts of money unabashedly to creating this kind of grassroots, they created the Tea Party, basically. Uh, you know, politi politicians in the U.S. have to basically uh, Cow to the to the you know, Republicans to the Koch brothers, or they're not they don't get a lot of money. Um, you know this whole so-called Freedom Caucus, which is a scary, scary thing. Free, the Freedom Caucus in the U.S. Congress, what what that means is these people these are the real hardcore extremists. These are the guys that don't believe in in you know. Social Security, they don't believe in taxes, they don't believe in anything. They're the ones that they thought this health care bill, this horrible health care bill that's going to take 24 million, take the health care away from 24 million Americans, they thought it was too, too generous, you know. But, but anyway, uh, you know, I, I guess one thing I would say is that it, it is, you're partly right, that because of the U.S., political financing system, the extremists in the US, the libertarians, the, the Charles and David Cokes, are much more powerful. They're much, because there's essentially no restraint on big money in politics <coughs> after the Supreme Court decision to that effect. Um, you know, there's a wonderful quote, I always love Mark Hanna, um, who was an operative, uh, Republican operative in the 1890s, a real kind of Karl Rove character. And he's quoted as saying, um, he made a speech once saying, you know, there, there's, there's only two things that matter in politics. The first is money, and I can't remember the second. <laughs> you know, and, and that, that pretty well, explain, you know, does sum it up. But so, so the, 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 the horrible nature of their political finance system just has made this stuff go crazy since that Citizens United decision uh, in the Obama year. So we're talking about a recent development of the past 10 years of it just ex exploding as a problem. Um, so so it, it is worse than the US. I guess all I would say is we are seeing, and in Canada, we do have a much better political finance system, no question, okay? I, I could criticize aspects of it, but the, it's basically way better than the Americans. It does a better job in keeping money out. But I guess what I want to say is we do see evidence of the same kind of thinking growing in Canada. You know, the Fraser Institute, the what is it, the Mackenzie Laurier Institute, the, uh, I can't remember all the, you know, competitive, the, there's one out in the Atlantic Market Studies Institute, there's a bunch of them. Uh, and they're well funded, and they're treated respectfully in the press, and they're, they're, they're growing in influence. Um, and, and also, like something like the, um, that Brian Day challenge to healthcare, Apparently, like there's a, if you go to the website, there's a, there's a site of, 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 that is raising money to help Brian Day with his attack on Canadian health care. And it's getting a lot of money from the states, apparently. Um, you know, Michael Walker's on the board. Um, and there's rumors that the Koch brothers are actually putting money in. Because when you think about it, from the Koch brothers' point of view, why wouldn't you want to? 
expand into Canada. For one thing, the Koch brothers are very involved in the oil sand, so they would want to influence the debate up here. Uh, but, but also because you want to basically knock out the example of where the public sector works well. You don't want that as an example that the uh, Americans can see. You want Americans to be able to believe that, you know, public health care doesn't work in Canada. I always remember one time I was watching, I was watching a TV show in, in the middle of a, okay, sorry, this, this is the end of it, I'll just say, <laughs> but it's, it's so amazing. It was in the middle of one of those debates about reforming the health care system in the U.S., <laughs> And some commentator said, you know, on this live TV broadcast, he said, well, you know, Canadian healthcare just doesn't work at all. So, like, for instance, last month, it was the month of December, last month, all hospitals in Ontario had to be shut for the entire month. They just ran out of money. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm sitting there watching it. Now, now, with social media, maybe you could correct it, but back then, I was just thinking, oh my God, oh my God, like millions of Americans seeing that, the host didn't question it or anything, it just went uncorrected. Anyway, my point is, I think you're right, I don't think the problem is nearly as bad here, but I think it's on the rise and I think the Canadian Conservatives are getting sustenance and encouragement from what they see south of the border. So all the more reason that we have to stand up and fight them. So thank you so much. I've really enjoyed this. Thanks a lot.